Hey you, and welcome. My name is Mike, and in this whole video, uh, I'm taking you to Texas to tell you a story about jealousy, about wigs, about revenge, and about betrayal. It's like the classic Texas quadruple sum right there. Every story I tell in Texas actually has those traits. Y'all really are cowboys. So yeah, uh, this story. Stick to the script. True crime, yeah. Just outside of Houston lies the city of Clear Lake. City. And in July 2003, a house full of friends became a house full of bodies. This case went cold for years until one phone call changed everything. Sort of. What happened? Well, I hear you barking, big dog. Let's give it a go. Just outside the city of Houston lies Clear Lake City, a planned community of houses. A maze, without the zing, of suburbia. Other than thousands of houses and a few of prayer, the big draw to Clear Lake is the NASA Johnson Space Center. Big rockets, wow. That is cool. I'll say that's like, that is actually genuinely cool as shit. Also, Boeing, Lockheed Martin, all the like badass boo rockets are made there, and the people who are doing the making live in. Clear Lake City, it's, it's got a very high graduate rate in that area simply because it's full of scientists, literal rocket scientists. None in this story, I'm sad to say. Across the field from the Space Center lies Clear Lake High School, home of the Falcons. It was established in 1972, 10 years after the Space Center, and today it enrolls over 2,000 students. Back in the early 2000s, two of those students was one Tiffany Rowell and two Rachel Colorudis, and they seemed destined for a great life ahead. Rachel was born in 1984 and was debating joining the Air Force out of school, but until then, she kept herself busy babysitting, working at UPS or Denny's, leading a youth drama club, a youth counsellor, pretty much it all. Tiffany was much the same. A talented actress too, and she dreamed of becoming a social worker after school, always looking out for the underdog. And when I say they were kind, I mean it, especially when a small, lonely girl with alopecia all the way from New York City started attending Clear Lake High School. See, recently enough arrived to the area was one Lori Paolilla and her two children, John and the younger Christine. Christine Paolilla was born on Long Island in 1986 to mother Lori and dad Charles. Tragically, however, dad Charles was killed when Christine was only two years old. He was a construction worker and a ton of bricks hit him like a ton of bricks, and he was killed stone dead. Strangely enough, Charles had a policy that listed Christine as the sole beneficiary. His two-year-old daughter, not his wife, not his son. That's weird as shit. Fuck his wife and his son, right? He was saving it all for his baby girl. Okay then, well, thing is though, Christine, she wouldn't be able to access uh, that kibosha until she turned 18 years of age. And it was a good bit. So it was like a couple of hundred grand put away. But that doesn't really help much when Lori, a stay-at-home mother, now had two kids and no income. So a hell of a lot of good, that decision did his uh, surviving family. And soon after, Lori, she she turned to drugs, essentially. Um, she got into the drugs. I'm talking the schnock, I'm talking the H-dog. And soon, Christine and John would go and live with various family members, eventually their grandparents more permanently. Then in 1991, five-year-old Christine woke up in horror, I guess you could say. She woke up one morning and her hair was all over her pillow. At five years old, if you can believe it, Christine had developed alopecia. She, like, over the course of a couple of weeks, she was completely bald, down to her eyelashes even. Gone. So that doesn't really help when you're a young girl growing up, I imagine. This affected her self-esteem a huge amount, and when combined with the bottle glasses she wore, she wasn't swimming in confidence. You can imagine this would be pretty traumatizing for, for young Christine. She was bullied and made fun of, like, a lot in, in her New York school. Uh, kids would laugh at her, they would steal her wig and point laugh at her. That sucks. Kids suck. 
She wasn't a great student either, and so it didn't look peachy for the future. That was until Lori, eventually she got back in touch with her children, she had gotten clean, and she'd gotten uh, remarried to a guy named Tom, Dick, no Harry, or is it Larry? And eventually all of them made up six and they moved down to uh, just outside of Houston, Texas. Before things went up though, they went down. As a lonely 14 year old new you know, Texan immigrant, she fell in with the wrong crowd. She started dabbling in the reefer, ladies and gentlemen. You know, they're doing a, doing a bit of the Mary J. You know, hardcore stuff. And she, you know, dabble a few drinky drinks maybe. And at a party, she met a guy named Chris Snyder. And I mean, he couldn't look any more late 90s. Copious amounts of hair gel, goatee, eyebrow piercing, Boo, even though I used to have one, don't tell anybody. He even had the chain dangling from his jeans. Whoa boy, you guys. And he also wore, you know, oversized everything, as was the style at the time. This, this was, he was one cool cat. And no wonder, uh, checks notes, a 14 year old girl would be impressed. She fell for him as he would always tell her that he didn't care about the thing all the other kids made fun of her for. To her, he seemed to be the first person who didn't care that she was completely bald, and he was rough around the edges, and he was exciting. And they hit it off, they were inseparable, even though he was two years older. Chris and Christine, they did everything together, except when he did an armed robbery. She didn't take part in that. He spent some time in jail for that one, and after, he went straight back to Christine, who was waiting for him. Now, Tom and Lori, they disapproved of this relationship. No shit. Um, I mean, they were not big fans of Chris. I mean, he had already done time in the can. The shit can. And now he was like, um, he was very controlling over Christine. He wouldn't let her see her friends. Wouldn't let her see her family. He would emotionally abuse her too. It was a real sack of shit. Like one day, uh, he was waiting for her as she came out of school, out of class, and he basically just took her wig off in front of all of her classmates. Uh, as you can imagine, that's not very nice. But she stuck with him. After all, she had known bullying and she had known loss. Her dad died at a young age, uh, shortly after her grandfather died and then her great grandmother died and then her mother left. So you can imagine why Christine would be kind of clingy towards him. Uh, she'd lost enough people already. And this wasn't uh, one way though, you know, remember two sides to every story, right? She also was obsessive over him. She would call him nonstop. She, she would sleep on his lawn. She would show up banging on the door to see him at all hours. Christine was extremely jealous too. Chris sniffed after another girl. She would start beating on him. She was jealous the other girls didn't have to go through what she did. Christine's family didn't like him. His family didn't like her. They thought she was a psycho hose beast. <laughs> Crazy, crazy love, you know, Amor, Amor Fu, Amor Fu, Amor get fucked. So Christine Paolilla's parents, they disapproved of her relationship with Chris Snyder, as did her new best friends, Rachel and Tiffany. When Christine made friends with them, this is like the opposite of the Chris part, she was like happier than she'd ever been, ever. She started at freshman high school while Chris was still put away, and that's where she met. Uh, the two girls. They were a year ahead of her in school, they were popular, they were cool, and they bonded intensely. They took Christine under their wing, and they did everything that wasn't with Chris together. They showed her how to dress, style herself, do the makeup. They were a year ahead of her and showed her the ropes. Christine, she felt so comfortable and trusted Tiffany and Rachel so much that at home when she was a wit just them, she wouldn't even wear her wigs around them, which was a huge leap for her. Christine, she went from awkward outcast to cool, beautiful girl herself, confident and popular. In 2003, Christine was voted by the school Miss Irresistible. Wait, can I just hold up just real quick for one, one second? Anybody else thinking this? Smiley. What is I it? Again. Again. And again. Joking. In May 2003, Tiffany and Rachel, they graduated. Christine was still in school. Rachel and Tiffany moved in together to a small brick and wood home in the area as they prepared for their post-school adventures. And they both worked in a bar over the summer. Tiffany at the time was dating a guy named Marcus Priscilla, and he began staying with them too, along with Marcus's cousin, Adelbert Sanchez. They would have parties there all the time at Christine, you know, still in school, still a year behind. She was working at the makeup counter in Walgreens at the time. She began to feel, once again, uh, abandoned. All she had was Chris Snyder. 
fucking Diamond Chris over here. Drugs once again became the go-to. They even partied all six of them together at times. Marcus and Adelbert dabbled in the reefer, so they had that going for them. And every time Tiffany and Rachel would say to Christine, Dump Chris, he's bad news, he's a loser. Get out of it, you know. And he would be bad news, only it would be for uh, Tiffany and Rachel. On the night of July 18th, 2003, police were called to a house in Clear Lake. Their house. Friends had called over and found... Well. 3706 Millbridge Drive was the address police raced to, and upon opening the door, found blood everywhere. The girls were due to have a party that night, and so kids with their little, their little six packs of Bud Light were the ones to find them. Inside was a horrifying scene. Blood was everywhere. On the couch lay Tiffany on the right, Adelbert on the left. Both had been shot dead. On the floor lay Rachel and Marcus, the same. Countless shell casings from two different weapons were found, blood pooling left, right, and center. Two had been shot as they sat. Marcus, it looked like he had tried to run, but he didn't make it. Rachel, who lay on the floor, had also been severely and brutally beaten around the face, and she'd been shot in the groin multiple times as had Tiffany. Beside Rachel lay her cell phone, with 911 dialed. She just never managed to hit the call button. As you can imagine, the victim's parents raced to the scene. Here's a, here's a clip of Rachel's father trying to get in. It's, it's pretty heartbreaking. George Colarudis would actually be a driving force behind solving the case and keeping it in the news. He made sure no one forgot about his daughter and her friends. The facts they spoke for themselves. Uh, two different you know, types of shell casings were found, so two different weapons, meaning two different, likely two different uh, perpetrators. You know, um, Two of them were found sitting on the couch, chilling, so likely, you know, they, there wasn't, uh, you know, a struggle or a fight. Uh, in fact, it looked like whoever had done this, they let in, they likely knew him. A neighbor had heard the gunshots, but thought it was, it was firecrackers, and so it wasn't reported. Neighbors had seen the suspects, said the female led the way into the house. They stood out as it was an extremely hot day, and they were wearing all black. The first port of call, though, was that Marcus, he had been known to sell the, the marijuana. Drug deal gone bad, he thinks. They thinks. But no drugs or money were stolen, so... The investigation began, and witnesses saw two people there earlier, a young man and a young woman. Sketches were done. Now, what was Christine doing at this time, I wonder? Well, she was the object of great, G-R-E-A-T, sympathy. You know, oh, you poor pet, your two best friends. They were just horrifically murdered. Oh no. And Christine and Chris stayed together, still continuing their relationship. One that even Sauron, I think, would say, ooh, that's dark. They did drugs, they did petty crimes together, and things were not so good. Christine's parents would even call the cops on her from time to time. But the actual police work went nowhere. Like, I'm talking complete dead end. It's not even a maze. You, you didn't even get into the maze. The maze is closed. No entrance to the maze after 10 p.m. It went nowhere. The drug deal, you know, thought went out the window pretty soon as they found lots of money and drugs still in the house. The killings seem likely, um, you know, intentional. It seemed like the, the killings was the objective, killing them. Uh, both, both the girls, Tiffany and Rachel, they'd been shot several times in the groin, so it seemed very personal. But the actual evidence was quite tough. The gun casings seemed to lead nowhere, and the house was a party house. People were coming and going all the time. There was essentially the DNA of dozens of people everywhere. And Christine's name, it never came up. After all, she was still in high school. You know, still a kid. Miss Irresistible. $100,000 was offered for information. Tips came and went, eventually drying up entirely.
Christine once again went back to drugs in 2004, a year after graduating. She was arrested for shoplifting, uh, and she went into rehab. Things once again not looking up. The one good thing was that she did actually finally eventually properly Finito break up with Chris Snyder, so he's out of the picture. And Christine went from one fella to another. While in rehab, she met a Justin Rott, a heroin addict. Justin was more or less the same situation as Chris. They became obsessed with each other and yada yada yada. One year later, wasting no time, they married. At the same time, remember her dad's uh, life insurance? Well, cha-ching, uh, yeah, $360,000 went straight into her bank account, which she used to buy an apartment straight away for her and her new husband. Now, of course, no disrespect to people who have had substance abuse issues in the past or the present. It sucks. Um, but for Christine and Justin, what you think would have happened when she got quite a lot of money, well, that happened. On the 8th of July 2006, so almost exactly three years to the day after the quadruple homicide, Houston police, uh, they got a phone call, anonymous, from someone who seemed to know a lot about the murders. Um, now they, they didn't do it, but they said they had spoke to someone in rehab who confessed was the word they used. Actually, brag was the word they had used. And they were able to tell, this anonymous caller was able to tell the police, you know, things only the killer would know, including that uh, Rachel had tried to dial 911 before she was stopped and executed. He gave the police the name Christine Paolilla, one they had never really followed up on, even though at the crime scene they found a yearbook picture of Christine and written on the back was Rachel, 2002. Damn, we've had some crazy memories. We've always been there for each other, and I heart you, always. Never forget our special friendship. I heart you, Christine. Are you kidding me? What the- Fuck. Christine looked like the sketch, and witnesses would confirm that was who they had seen. But where were they? Where was Christine, and where was Chris? Well, Christine, she was with her hubby, Justin, holed up in a La Quinta Inn in San Antonio. Things went, um as you would uh, have suspected. I hope they were diligent collectors of syringes because they had quite a few. See, it turned out a while ago that Christine, she had seen a news report uh, about the murders and she had seen the sketches and she started panicking. And so uh, her and Justin went back on the drugs and it went into hiding into a motel, like Jesse Pinkman style. She was arrested on July 19th, 2006. When interviewed, in between bouts of her getting sick from withdrawals... So, um, there was. Okay, okay. She was saying Chris was responsible. It was his idea. He had done it to steal the drugs, and she had tried to stop him. Of course, this didn't make sense as no drugs were taken. But she said she never went into the house. But of course, two guns were used. Then she would say that she'd been forced to shoot that old, uh, the good old one. You know, the gun just went off. So, the gun was in your hand, and what was he telling you? One, two, three? He, he was holding on to it, too. Okay, like on top of your hand or something? Yes. Like, yeah, like I, I, I couldn't even tell you how it was, like, but that one that, that, um, like, I was scared and I was, like, crimping, and then I, uh, I had made the, the gun go off. Not, not purposely, though, but, like, it, it went to, the, like, the back of the room because I was just, like, screaming, just, like, shaking. So somehow you pulled the trigger? Yes. Okay. And he's like, you know, one, two, three, and he's like, come on, you, you bitch, you bitch, you bitch, and you, and you started just screaming at me, and then... You know, I'm not even sure if I hit anyone, that, uh, that gag. How many times do you think it went off in your hand? A million times. Like, I, I heard, like, shots, but, but it wasn't from my gun, it was, or the one that, that he gave me. I, I, I couldn't even tell you how, like, it was, it was, okay. but... It, it was his force that was making like it the, go off. Yes. Okay. Were you hitting anyone? I I don't I don't know. I it, come on, it, it's important. This is important. Okay, you're doing a good job. If 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 you're if you're like this and you're doing it, you know that you're hitting the person in front of you. Well, it, we it, we weren't really like in front of anybody. Were you near anyone? We, it was it was almost back, like in the middle of them in the door. But whatever happened, Chris, he, he made me do it. He was responsible. The abused partner who did whatever he said. A few years ago, uh, who was Chris Snyder to you? 
um, very controlling, very, um, very scary person whenever he, uh, his temper would, whenever his temper was pushed or whenever he would, um, felt he had to prove something, he would act very, uh, bully-like, very, um, hard-ass kind of, and, um, there's, there's been times where, uh, he can get almost satanic talking about um, people like, I wonder what it'd be like to, to kill someone or. Justin was also questioned by the police, of course, and he said to the police she had told a different story, that she'd confessed to it all. She had gone in there with Chris in a jealous rage and murdered her once best friends. Together, they had executed them all and left. However, Christine went back inside and saw that Rachel was still alive, barely, and so beat her face in with the handle of her gun, and then Chris drove her to her job at Walgreens. These were women who had taken her in, took care of her, showed her the ropes, were like someone she could look up to, but then, Christine's eyes, they, uh, they abandoned her. So they had to go, and it was vicious, it was jealous, it was, it, she shot them in the groin in what was described as a fit of jealous Jealous rage, sexual jealousy. Chris was along for the free drugs. But what was Chris's story? Well, once the news broke that Christine was arrested, a family member of Chris Snyder's called him. See, at the time he was in Greenville, South Carolina, and called him and said, hey, listen, the police are probably gonna be looking for you real soon. So he did a runner. The police followed and eventually found him in the woods. He had killed himself overdosing on prescription medication. Christine Paolilla went on trial in 2008, and she was convicted on all four counts of murder. This would be a death penalty case, except Christine was a juvenile at the time of the murders, and so she was sentenced to life in prison, where she is remaining today. She will be eligible for parole in 2046, at 60 years of age. And so that ends this old tale. What you think? It's a tale, you know, as old as time itself. Jealousy, rage, all the big dogs right there. Abandonment, I guess, although I think that was also in her own head. More than likely, uh, before, you know, Christine and Tiffany. What an end for them. And of course, Marcus and Aylbert too. Christine, she was, it seems like she was someone who never really had much of a chance. And then when finally these two girls took her in, they gave her a chance. It's like, um, it's almost like, you know, a rescue dog that's like been beaten. You know, it just it went for the throat, as you know, uh, as soon as she saw the signs appearing again, and sadly ended the lives of four people. Shanae, thank you as always for watching. It really means so much to me. Um, please go check out my Twitter, that underscore chapter. Please check out my Instagram, that underscore chapter two, where you can find me drinking hot sauce in Salem, and it was a challenge, and I won it. I'm very proud of myself for doing that, not gonna lie. Also, check out the Patreon where it's two bucks a month you get early access to videos and also there's a whole pile of Patreon only exclusive that chapter videos and live streams. It's a lot of fun. You can check it out if you want. That's cool if you don't too. Pretty soon I will also be covering the highly requested uh, Moscow, Idaho uh, murders. Extremely tragic and it seems like the police are getting nowhere near finding out the guy who did it. So keep an eye out for that. But until then, please take care of each other as always because I love you. Mike out.